point of view of pathology that is kidney pathology so as we all know the kidney is divided into four parts so nephropathology can be easily studied if we divide kidney into four parts glomerulus tubules blood vessels and interstitium so out of these the most important part is glomerulus so today we will focus our attention on the glomerular diseases so as we all know glomerulus is the functional unit of the kidney right and this structure all of you must have seen but remember what is glomerulus it is made up of a bowman capsule enclosing tract of capillaries so that is a layman's term let's go to a pathology perspective so this tract of capillary we will take a cross section of it and let's see what we see we see that this tract of capillary is made up of capillaries okay this capillary is supported on the basement membrane and basement membrane on the outer side is lined by special type of epithelial cells known as podocytes or visceral epithelial cells why they are called podocytes because podo means feet so they have small feet with which they rest on the basement membrane as you all know endothelium is lined by uh, sorry capillary is lined by endothelium so the layer of endothelium basement membrane and podocytes together constitute the filtration barrier of the kidney so this is the filtration barrier of the kidney now one question arises if the visceral epithelial cells are present just outside the basement membrane what is the location of parietal epithelial cells so parietal epithelial cells line the bowman capsule they line the bowman capsule so here comes the visceral epithelial cells and outside there are the parietal epithelial cells so they do not form a part of the filtration barrier okay because they line the bowman's capsule and what is mesangium everybody is always confused what is mesangium this duct of capillary is supported in a connective tissue network this connective tissue network is made up of mesangium okay so connective tissue network on which lies the blood vessel capillaries is the mesangium and what are these mesangial cells mesangial cells are nothing but macrophages they are mesothelial in origin number 1 they are mesodermal in origin they are macrophages of the kidney and so and the major function is to eat up any deposit which is deposited in the kidney so this is mesangium now we'll come to all the structure and their important points one by one number 1 endothelium the endothelium of the kidney is very different from the endothelium at other places why because it contain it is very fenestrated okay it is very fenestrated and the size of the fenestration is 7200 nanometer right this size is just enough for the smallest protein that is albumin to pass through okay so this is the fenestrated endothelium of the kidney now we come to the basement membrane now right? basement membrane of the kidney is made up of type 4 collagen so basement membrane of the kidney is made up of type 4 collagen it's a trimeric protein so it has alpha chains attached with it the most common alpha chains which are attached are alpha 3 alpha 4 and alpha 5 usually the alpha chains that are present are alpha 1 to alpha 6 most common ones are 3 that is alpha 3 alpha 4 and alpha 5 this collagen also has its non collagenous domain non collagenous domain what is the importance of this non collagenous domain it is that it acts as antigen in many of the immune disorders of the kidney or many glomerulopathy 
non collagenous to mean the collagen absent the antigen. I'll be telling you in detail about this later on. The second composition of the basement membrane is polyanionic proteoglycans. These polyanionic proteoglycans give negative charge to the basement membrane. So as we all know that the filtration barrier of the kidney is charge and size dependent barrier, right? So size I have already told you, the cut off sizes of the slits are known. What about charge? The basement membrane is negatively charged due to presence of polyanionic proteoglycans. So this gives the negative charge to the basement membrane and that is why anything, all the proteins are negatively charged. So it repels any protein which comes. So I told you before itself, albumin has the size just enough to pass through the fenestration of the endothelium but still it never comes into the urine. The reason is the charge. The charge of the basement membrane repels the albumin and that is why albumin never comes into the urine. Right? And the third composition of the basement membrane is the proteins, various proteins but one of them very important is laminin protein. Okay? So this is the composition of basement membrane. Apart from the composition, the structure of the basement membrane is also very important to understand right now. So this is the basement membrane. Okay. Okay, so this is just a pictorial depiction. So this is your endothelium, this is your visceral epithelial cells and this is your basement membrane. So basement membrane is ultra structurally divided into three parts. That is the most dense part in the center is known as lamina densa. Okay, it's known as lamina densa. Then there are these rare, these are electrolucent parts. Though that facing, the part facing the endothelium is known as lamina rara interna. Lamina rara interna. And though facing the epithelial side, it is lamina rara externa. Okay. So, we have three parts of the basement membrane, lamina rara interna, lamina densa and lamina rara externa. These three are very important because in some hereditary nephropathies, the alteration of these structures this is seen. Okay? Apart from that, the thickness of the basement membrane is very important. The normal thickness of the basement membrane is 300 to 400 nanometers. Okay? If its size is decreased than 250 nanometer, then it is known as thin basement membrane disease. Then it is known as thin basement membrane disease, which is a type of hereditary glomerulopathy. Okay, so that is an MCQ. That is less than 250 nanometer. Please remember that. Now we come to the third important part of the structure that is podocytes. So what are podocytes? They are visceral epithelial cells and they rest on the basement membrane with the help of their feet. That is why they are known as podocytes. So podocytes are the most most important part uh, cells which play a role in this filtration. So the MCQ comes like this which is the most important cell that plays a role in filtration. These are podocytes. Please remember, the podocytes are separated from each other with the help of small diaphragms, small spaces. These are known as filtration slits. These spaces are known as filtration slits. The diameter of the slit is 20 to 30 nanometer. 20 to 30 nanometer. It is 
okay, 20 to 30 nanometer, the space between the slip. So, podocytes are very important in filtration. Now, apart from this structure, the ultra-structural proteins of the podocytes are also catching attention nowadays. So, let's see the structure of the podocytes. So, this is a structure just opposite to this. So, this is a basement membrane. This is the endothelium and you remember on the outer side of the basement membrane is visceral epithelial cells. So, this is one podocyte, this is second podocyte. So, two podocytes are joined together by a slit, a protein known as nephrin. This protein is known as nephrin. On the inner side, the nephrin is joined by another protein known as podocin. Okay, podocin is connected to another protein known as CD2AP. This is CD2 associated protein. And CD2AP is in turn connected to actin network. It is connected to actin network. So these are the four basic proteins which form the structure of the podocytes. Nephrin joins the slit between two podocytes internally connected by podocin, CD2AP and actin. So these four. Why this is important is why this is important is that the mutation in all these three proteins, all these proteins can cause human disease except mutation in CD2AP. CD2AP mutation does not cause any human disease whereas all these three are concerned with human diseases. So that is a very important point that you should know, right? So that finishes the basics of the kidney. So one more thing you should tell you, I should tell you. The proliferation of parietal epithelial cells is known as crescent. So, what is a crescent? Crescent is nothing but proliferation of parietal epithelial cell. Right? So, I told you points about each and every cell of the kidney and I hope your basics are very clear now. And then we further move on to the pathogenesis of the glomerular diseases, right? So coming to the pathogenesis of the glomerular diseases. Now, in contrast to the tubular diseases in the kidney, which are mostly mediated by toxins or some infections, toxins, vascular disorders, the glomerular disorders principally occur due to immunological causes, yani immune dysfunction or immune deposits. So immunological cause is the most important cause behind any glomerular disease. Now, the most common pathogenesis which involves in glomerular diseases is either it is an antibody mediated disease or cellular mediated immunity or through alternate complement pathway. So pathogenesis involves these three points but most important of all these three is antibody mediated disease. This is very important. So, most common pathogenesis behind the glomerular diseases is antibody mediated disease. These antibodies can be formed, they, will, they can either go and form in situ immune complexes or they can form circulating immune complexes. So, in situ means that immune complexes are formed in the glomerulus itself. So, which are the antigens? Whenever there are immune deposits, always you should ask what are the antigens? So, antigens can either be fixed antigens or planted antigens. So, fixed antigens means they are already present in the glomerulus. So, the most common fixed antigens are non-collagenous domain of collagen type 4 of the basement membrane. This I have already told you in the basic part that each collagenous domain has a non-collagenous part also. So that acts as the most common antigen in, uh, in in situ complexes and it causes disease known as anti-GBM disease. The disease known as anti-GBM disease. The second antigen which has been given by the new Robins is phospholipase A2 which acts as an antigen in membranous disease, membranous glomerulopathies okay, of the kidney. All these antigens can be planted antigens. Planted means that the antigens have come from 
outside. Now they can come from outside the body that is exogenous or they can be inside the body they are endogenous. So exogenous cause most important is some infective etiologies, any infection and the endogenous cause is DNA which and the disease associated most commonly is SLE. Sometimes the immune complexes are formed outside the kidney that is they are circulating immune complexes and they come and they get trapped in the kidney. So these in these conditions the antigens can be exogenous again or endogenous. Same exogenous are always infected. Endogenous could be in endogenous proteins like DNA. Right. The second important mechanism is cell mediated immunity. This pathway is not yet known well. But they, they have just postulated that probably T lymphocytes cause injury to the kidney. Okay, this mechanism is not well known. And the third mechanism is all activation of alternate complement pathway. This disease is well documented in MPGN type 2, also known as dense deposit disease. So this is important MCQ. So activation of alternate complement pathway is known in MPGN type 2 or dense deposit disease. So in kidney you should always know the pathogenesis because if you know the pathogenesis you will never go wrong in any of the kidney diseases. Okay, so that is with pathogenesis. Now, these immune complexes can be deposited in any part of the kidney. So, for your sake, we will just draw a pictorial diagram like this. We know that this is basement membrane. Okay. This is endothelium. This is visceral epithelial cells. Okay. And they are resting in the Mesangial background is mesangial cells. So the deposits can be present in sub endothelial location. So sub endothelial location is between the endothelium and the basement membrane. This is known as sub endothelial deposit. The characteristic feature of this kind of deposit is that since it is near the blood vessel, so it elicits high inflammation. There is lot of inflammation whenever there are subendothelial deposits. Okay. So usually subendothelial deposits can be seen in many diseases, but it is characteristically seen in MPG. And this chart is just a quick recap of what we are going to see in future in chapters. So that is subendothelial deposits, right? Then the deposits can be seen here. So what are these known as? This is an epithelium. The deposit between the epithelium and the basement membrane is known as subepithelial deposit. So the characteristic feature of a subepithelial deposit is it does not incite lot of inflammation. There is very less inflammation in the glomerulopathies which are associated with subepithelial deposits. So which is the condition where you can see subepithelial deposits? Many conditions we will see but one characteristic which I want to just name it right now it is membranous nephropathy. So membranous nephropathy characteristically shows you subepithelial deposits. Okay. Then this deposits, either the deposits can be seen in the mesangium also. So mesangial deposits are the characteristic features of IgA nephropathy. So IgA nephropathy shows you mesangial deposits. So this is just a small recap of what all we can see. So these are the common locations where the deposits can occur. They where the immune deposits can occur and that defines what kind of reaction a glomerulopathy is decided to have. Okay. 
So that is the pathogenesis. After studying the pathogenesis and the location of the organs, we should know how are we going to study the kidney diseases. For studying the kidney diseases, we need a kidney biopsy. So, kidney biopsy and this is from where lot of questions come. How do we study the kidney biopsy? Kidney biopsy is whenever you come across a kidney biopsy, it is divided into three parts for three special investigations which should be done in kidney. One, light microscopy. Second, immunofluorescence. And third, electron microscopy. Okay, each of them have their own peculiar features. For any light microscopy, the fixative of choice is 10% buffered neutral formula. That's it. That is the fixative of choice for light microscopy. The fixative of choice for immunofluorescence is Michel's media. That is the fixative of choice for immunofluorescence. In the, in the fixative of choice for electron microscopy is 2% glutaraldehyde. So these are the choice of fixatives. So whenever you do a kidney biopsy, you put them in the respective in the respective filter uh, fixatives. So light microscopy helps you see what are the changes in the glomerulus on the light microscopy. Where is the proliferation? Which cell is proliferating? Endothelial, mesangium, parietal epithelial. So number one, which cell is proliferating? Number two, inflammation is present or not. And number three, any peculiar type of deposit. Any peculiar type of deposit. Like amyloid ulcers. Right? So these are the three important features which we see on light microscopy. The next advantage of light microscopy is we can also do special stains on it. So with this fixator, we can use special stains. So, what are the special stains which are done in kidney? Number one, silver methamine. Number two, pass. And number two, number three, empty. Okay. So, these are the three stains which we do on kidney. Silver methamine, pass and empty. Masons right now. So, these are the three stains we do on kidney. Now, coming to immunofluorescence. <coughs> immunofluorescence helps us giving two basic informations. Number one, it tells you what are the type of deposit, which antibody is mainly involved. IgG, IgM, IgA, C3 complement or C1 complement. So, it tells you what is the nature of antibody which is involved in the immune complex. So, that is very important in picking up the lesion. And number two, immunofluorescence helps us in picking up pattern of deposits. That is very important. So, we have in general two patterns of deposits of antibodies. So, the deposits can either be granular deposits or they can be linear deposits. So, what do you mean by granular deposits? Whenever there is focal accumulation of immune complexes, it shows you granular deposits. Okay? And whenever the antigen is present all over the epithelium, for example, in anti-GBM disease, the antigen is present all over the basement membrane, so, the immunofluorescence pattern which we you see in anti-GPM disease is linear because the antigen is present all over the glomerular basement membrane. So, there is the disease which shows you granular pattern of immunofluorescence is anti-GPM disease. Okay. All the other kind of nephropathies which you will read will usually show you granular pattern of immunofluorescence. So most of the immune complex 